the expedition nears the halfway mark. Rough seas and calm would carry the Benji B as she's known to her intimates from Australia to Alaska. The plan. In open boats, Ran and Charlie would sail the Yukon River, then navigate the notorious Northwest Passage to Ellesmere Island, where they would overwinter before attempting the pole. As in Antarctica, many experts had warned Ran his plan was unrealistic. The Northwest Passage had never been crossed in open boats. They'd be blocked by ice before reaching Ellesmere Island. A two-man team was unsafe. So we said goodbye to our friends on board and we wouldn't see them again for over a year. The trip ahead we knew would be very difficult indeed. We set out in two 12-foot open rubber boats, but quite quickly, going up the Yukon for a thousand miles, we realized that they would not be up to the icy hazards and the storms of the Northwest Passage, which lay ahead. Strong winds and currents combined with heavy loads had put too great a strain on the inflatable boats and their engines. What do you think it is, Jess? I think it's just plugs, I can't really tell. Breakdowns had become commonplace. So we had to have some other form of craft. So we got on by Morse code to Ginny to try and get us a Boston whaler, um, which would be fiberglass and tough enough that one, that for the one. ice and the storms ahead. If Ellesmere Island isn't reached before summer's end, they'd miss their deadline for the assault on the pole. They'd have to camp wherever they were and wait a full year for their next chance. We had storms, we had whiteouts, we had all manner of ice obstacles. But throughout it, Charlie's good humor remained steadfast. This must be the Yukon Bridge. <laughs> Unless we're lost. The 700th day of the expedition, another first to be recorded in travel history, the crossing of the Northwest Passage by boat in one season. Finally, they reach Ellesmere Island and the northernmost native settlement in the world. We then had to trek over the unmapped mountains of Ellesmere Island. And that is when I really realized the true courage of Charlie. How'd it happen, Charles? Uh, uh, it's just been thrown that rock over When I slipped on that ice and cracked my head open, I realized that there was a possibility of doing myself considerable bit of damage. I've been dreading this part for uh, about six years now, um, ever since I knew we had to walk up Ellesmere Land. My feet, in fact, my legs, are not the strongest for the simple reason that I've damaged them too often over 38 years. I was scared. I knew it was going to be hard to keep up with Ran, so it was a mental thing that I knew that I was going to do it, but in my time. And I had to realize that if I tried to keep up with Ran, I wasn't going to make it, because I was going to be dead off the first five minutes. <sighs> ah, a bit of blood there, blister on the top. Lots of dirt. I'm going to get a satisfaction when I finish. The satisfaction of knowing that I have put myself up to the environment and in fact succeeded and come back to civilization. A sane man, not only sane, but hopefully a better person. On the Arctic crossing, the one thing I dread the most is uh, the ice opening under my tent. Because I don't think really you've got much chance of getting out. You could try and swim out, but you're stuck in a sleeping bag. They had to average 10 miles a day. The first 80 have gone well. 
but before them now, a realm of endless pressure ridges, formed by the collision of old and new masses of ever-moving ice. They must carve a way through. Once they stop work, their sweat freezes instantly. Skin and beard adhere to clothing. Each arduous movement for making camp is done with great caution and discomfort in the extreme. March 3rd. Night surrenders to day for the next six months. The only thing you can think about is that it's got to get warmer because it can't get any colder. And it really is a joy to be alive when it's minus 36. It's nothing. You can practice sit down and sunbathe in it. The major pressure ridges behind them, they can once again travel by snowmobile. They have come 150 miles so far. Between them and the pole, 350 more. But with detours, perhaps 500. Then, if the pole is reached, south another 600 miles to rendezvous with the Benjamin Bowery. Just beneath the slowly shifting, deceptive blanket of ice, the Arctic Ocean itself, more than two miles deep. The Transglobe expedition to the North Pole has run into more trouble. Sir Ranulph Fiennes and Charles Burton are... The two-man team from the... British After two Council years of press and public apathy, the potential failure of the expedition suddenly puts Transglobe in the headlines. They're now 340 miles from the North Pole. By the time we eventually got near to the North Pole, we were definitely getting a bit weird. They're fatigued and peculiarly light-headed. It's strange. Right at the end. My feet are dead. No feeling. Very strange. Can you feel that there's no feeling? Oh, I can feel there's no feeling. What sort of feeling is it? No feeling. Yeah, I know the feeling. <laughs> the cold front has kept the feared breakup in abeyance. 60 miles to go, then 30. Zero Alpha, Zero Alpha, this is 2 4, over. On Easter Sunday, with the sun high in the sky, at 3 a.m., Ran makes the most significant call of the expedition. We have come 7.5 miles from the last check and reckon that we are at 90 north. We're at the pole. There's no one to meet us, but, um, but we're, we're here. Only a jumble of fractured ice marks the top of the world. And within a few days, the Union Jack will have drifted miles away with the ever-moving flow. While the moment may be transitory, its meaning is not. Rand Fines and Charlie Burton have become the first men ever to reach both poles the hard way. Let's go and have a couple of um, tea. I'll have coffee. 300 miles south of the pole, the snowmobiles can take them no farther across the increasingly tenuous ice. Over the three months, when Charlie and I sat in that tent on an ever-diminishing, disintegrating ice flow, floating slowly south, it was very frightening indeed. Very often, storms up to 100 miles away would start tsunamis of ice movement, which would crash the ice ahead. It was very bad. Very often, it was difficult to sleep. We 
We've been called lucky, but one isn't simply lucky when facing nature in the extreme and getting through in one piece. I don't think nature is comprised solely of a series of atoms. I believe she could and did bless us. of effort ended. No more painful farewells.